Hello, and welcome to the next session uh, of our uh, symposium. Uh, this session is uh, riffing off the last session, and we're going to have part two of lessons learned for more effective implementation. Um, I, I think this is a great opportunity to pick up right where we left off. Um, you know, the theme of our symposium is accelerating safer and sustainable alternatives. And as we heard in the last session, um, this practice of AA is expanding uh, and accelerating uh, in, in many ways. And so as we do that, it's, it's more important than ever that we uh, collaborate and coordinate and communicate. And A4 is a great opportunity to, to do that. So today we're going to have four great speakers um, and I'll, I'm going to introduce them shortly. Uh, and we're gonna go through some uh, housekeeping here uh, before we get started. Um, oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, trying to switch to the next screen, Molly, but I'm not, there we go. Uh, at this point, I wanna thank our, our sponsors for the symposium. Um, these folks gave not only of their, their um, money but, and, and funding, uh, but also a lot of their time and talent. And without them, we couldn't have the symposium. So thank you to them. Um, and I'm trying to move the next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, just a reminder that um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand by doing, doing that um, with, uh, uh, in your Zoom link. Um, we're going to ask that you keep your line muted and your video off, um, and, but you can change your name to make sure that we know who you are and put your organization by clicking on your image. Um, also, uh, the best way to observe the session is to use the speaker view. Uh, we will also uh, allow uh, an opportunity for questions and answers for after each speaker. We're gonna have each speaker get, have speak for about 15 minutes and we'll have a five minute session for Q&A. Um, you can either raise your hand or the most effective way might be to use the, the chat function uh, and we can go from there. If we have time at the end of the session, we will have additional uh, opportunities for question and answers. This session is being recorded and it'll be available to members and everyone uh, after the, the symposium. Again, raise your hand, go to the raise your hand icon and um, raise your hand. And when you're done, please lower your hand as well. Um, our speakers today, we're really uh, blessed to have um, an outstanding crew. We have Tim Malloy, who's a professor of law at UCLA Law School here in California. We have Matt Wilk, an economist with the European Chemicals Agency. Daniel Slunier from the University of Gothenburg, who's the Research and Policy Engagement Director. And Paul Ashford from Anth Anthesis Caleb, and he's their managing director. So uh, with that, we will move uh, into our first speaker. Um, and that is uh, Tim Malloy. And so we're going to hand the controls over to Tim uh, and take it away, Tim. Hey, thanks very much, Carl, and to Molly and Jennifer and gosh, all the other organizers and sponsors for putting this on. I'm really excited um, about the whole symposium and especially this uh, panel. So look, really looking forward to it. So um, our work on AA and its role in pesticide regulation um, really focuses on how AA could be integrated into California's regulatory program for pesticides. Uh, what's interesting about California law is that it explicitly requires that regulators consider feasible alternatives before a pesticide can be approved for sale in California and before it can be actually used in California. Historically, the responsible uh, agencies at the state level and at the county level have not done this. Recently, as a result of some extensive uh, advocacy work by uh, a number of NGOs and others, and uh, because of a recent appellate court decision, the agencies have essentially stepped up to the plate and are working to incorporate AA into their decision making, which leads to our core research question, which is, uh, well, what would, or maybe even what should incorporating AA into the relevant state and county regulatory programs look like? Um, to help us in answering this question, we held a virtual two-day workshop through which we brought together a range of stakeholders, 
And we used a simulated pest, the citron scale, which afflicts uh, citrus plant trees and associated pest management strategies. And we use this simulated uh, uh, case study to explore views regarding AA in this context. So uh, we weren't trying to reach consensus. Okay, so we brought together a, a range of stakeholders, you know, folks from government, from NGO advocacy groups, labor groups, environmental groups, growers, you know, the farmers, uh, uh, pest control advisors, academics, you know, a broad range of folks. Uh, we weren't trying to get them to reach consensus on any particular approach, although I will say that there were some general principles around which uh, we thought we saw some, some general agreement. But rather, we were using the workshop to kind of provide us some insight to help us understand the context in which um, in which uh, AA might work in the California regulatory setting. So what I'm presenting today, uh, we just had this workshop over the summer. So I'm presenting some preliminary thoughts and recommendations that have been developed by the project team. Um, so I want to do three things. Uh, first, I want to speak a bit about what we call the unique socio-regulatory system in which this plays out. I think you have to understand that to kind of understand the challenges facing AA in this setting. Uh, second, I'll speak to some of those challenges. And uh, then I'll float one perceptual uh, framework, conceptual framework that, we, um, that we're that we playing around with now. So I'm trying to see, uh, I don't see how to advance this thing. Ah, there we go. Okay. Somebody just did it for me. All right, thank you. All right, so the socio-regulatory system, let's see if this works. Uh, there we go. At the center of our system, of course, is the grower, right? So in California, there are 70,000 farms. Uh, almost 80% of these are owned by individuals or families, and 11% of them are partnerships. So uh, we don't necessarily have the image of the big corporate ag uh, farmer, although they are present in California. Uh, and also about 5% of these farms are organic. So we start with the farmer. All right. Next up is the pesticide manufacturer. I think that one is uh, self-explanatory. They are the other player so far. And then from a regulatory standpoint at the state level, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, or DPR, uh, is the one of the main players. Okay, so they are charged with the registration of pesticides. Uh, before a manufacturer uh, can market a pesticide in California, it has to be registered. And this is a fairly robust process uh, that layers on top of the federal registration process. Uh, when needed, DPR will perform a risk assessment and then uh, develop risk management measures that are incorporated into regulation or into the label for the pesticide. Uh, what's interesting here is that the pesticide statute and another statute in California known as the California Environmental Quality Act both explicitly require that DPR take into account uh, the availability of feasible alternatives in making a judgment about whether to approve a pesticide or not. Okay. Uh, another important player at the state level is the Office of Environmental uh, Health Hazard Assessment, or what we finally call OHIA. And OHIA is the lead state agency in California uh, that deals with human health and human health assessments uh, for a variety of state programs, not just DPR. But with respect to DPR, uh, OHIA will provide peer review of risk assessments and also consult with um, DPR on risk management approaches. All right, so those are our players at the state level. Let's move now uh, to the local level. And uh, a PCA, or what's known as a pest control advisor, uh, is an important uh, actor in this whole system. So these are licensed professionals who make recommendations to the growers about how to manage their various pest problems. Um, now, one thing that's important to note here is that a good portion of these pest control advisors are associated with or otherwise employed by pesticide dealers, right? Um, I simplified a little bit by drawing the dotted line from the manufacturer. There's some entities in between, but there is some association to one degree or another 
between the PCA, the pest control advisor, and the dealer or manufacturer. Um, the, uh, there are, uh, the PCAs will provide, as I mentioned, recommendations to the grower. And I should point out, there are also a fair number of PCAs in California who are independent, who are not in one way or another linked to a particular manufacturer or dealer. And the jobs of the PCAs are essentially to develop uh, pest, recommendate, pest management recommendations. So uh, when we think about it, you know, uh, it's easiest, I think, to think about four different types of recommendations that might be made or combinations of them. Uh, one, you know, the one we're focused on is the use of chemical pesticides. There's also biological controls, right? So using living organisms, these are typically natural enemies of the pest, uh, to do the pest population. Um, sometimes these biological controls require knocking the pest population down a bit through the use of a pesticide or other material, and then allowing the biological controls to uh, take effect at that point, sometimes not. Cultural practices, and I call these conventional cultural practices, meaning, you know, uh, not systemic changes to ag, but more practices that can be used in a particular field or orchard, or even in a standard uh, uh, farming setting. And these make the field or orchard less conducive to the survival or the growth or the reproduction of the pest. So, for example, in our case, the citron scale uh, lives on various types of citrus trees. And things like pruning the trees to get more air into them, mulching, uh, ant control of one sort or another can make those, uh, make those trees less attractive to the scale and reduce the pest population. And then lastly, there's what we were calling systemic change, right? So these are broad changes to kind of fundamental structure and operations of the ag more generally, not an individual farm essentially, but thinking about how do we get uh, ag in California or large portions of it to switch to more ecologically based uh, system approaches to essentially bring a balance to the to the soil and to the ag process. So think things here like agroecology or regenerative agriculture. Okay, so various PCAs will make suggestions. And interestingly, you know, the PCAs and making those re uh, re uh, recommendations are also required to think about the feasibility of alternatives and to counsel the growers about them. All right. Uh, we also have another play here, the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources Program. Uh, they act as a, also a, a, a consultant of sorts to both PCAs uh, and to growers. Um, UCANR uh, does both education, research, uh, demonstration about various pest uh, management strategies. Uh, and they're also instrumental in the development and research regarding integrated pest management as an approach to pest management. All right, so uh, we have all those folks. Uh, the last big player in California at the county level was the County Agricultural Commissioner. So this is another regulator working in tandem with the state regulator, DPR. Uh, the County Agricultural Commissioner um, reviews permit requests from farmers. So if you have a pesticide that is particularly worrisome, it's required to be permitted before it can be used. These are decisions that are made at the local level, right? At the county level. So the county agricultural commissioner's office will look at the particular farm, the pest, the crop, and make a judgment about whether the use of the pesticide meets standards that had been uh, established by DPR. DPR, in some instances, will provide uh, some information to CAC on individual issues, but also the CAC in make issuing the restricted permit or materials permit also must take into account the availability of safer uh, alternatives. So there we have it. So you can see it's kind of this, uh, it, it's a somewhat involved regulatory system and it raises some questions about, well, who should be doing the AA and for what purpose? Um, so let me talk a little bit now about the challenges of integrating AA into this somewhat complicated system. You know, to some degree, the usual sp suspects are present here, right? The same kind of issues we have with using AA in any kind of setting, data availability and data quality, for example. 
identifying alternatives um, and also kind of the metrics, the, the nature and metrics of the um, uh, uh, for measuring impacts, right? So these are all present here, but to some degree, we have, uh, we might say unique or amplified challenges in the pesticide setting. And one in particular that I want to address is this difficult threshold question of what exactly is the goal of using an AA in this system? Um, what are we attempting to accomplish? So I want to say a few words about that. All right. So we think about AA goals as sort of a continuum, right? And uh, we're thinking about the goal to be advanced or supported will play an important uh, role in determining like what the AA itself will look like and what the process will look like, who should be involved, who are the stakeholders, those sorts of questions. So we identified four basic goals and arranged them in a rough continuum of, I, I guess I would say, increasing intensity of intervention or impact on this system. I think it'll become clear what I mean when I show you what these goals are. So let me just lay them out. So we have um, the informative goal, the protective goal, the progressive goal, and then transformative goal. Okay, let's talk a little bit about each of them. So at the informative level, we're saying, look, you know, the AA is being generated and used to support downstream decision making by the end users, right? So uh, in the current system, it would assume that the decision about which alternative to use rests solely in the hands of a private entity and um, AAs are generated to help them making that decision. Uh, in the current decision uh, system, as I explained earlier, the decision essentially now is left with the PCA and the grower with virtually no input or oversight by the CAC. So this is kind of the world we're living in right now, except for the fact that we don't have a lot of AAs going on, at least that we know of or we've been able to find. Okay. Uh, the protective goal is really used to guard against kind of the uh, unintended consequences of banning uh, an incumbent chemical or disapproving of a proposed uh, entrant. So, uh, for example, at the state level, previously we've seen situations where the state looks at a proposed pesticide and the level of alternatives analysis they enter into is to say, you know, if we don't approve this, what will be the consequences? Will, you know, these pests be able to be managed? You know, so the question is really if not are we driving towards the adoption of alternatives, but what will be the harm that will happen if, um, if we reject the use of an existing or a prior, uh, uh, an existing or a new pesticide? Uh, we can see this happening at the federal level in uh, the amended TSCA statute in which alternatives assessments must be performed by EPA if they're thinking about banning a chemical to make sure that there are alternatives in place, that there won't be worse things that would happen. Okay. Uh, next up is the progressive goal. Um, and the progressive goal thinks about using AA to drive a shift towards safer conventional alternatives. So by conventional alternatives, I mean things that aren't going to, you know, drive systemic change in an entire industry, but rather make use of kind of things that we normally think about as being alternatives. These are the things that I talked about in um, the when I described the socio-regulatory system. So safer pesticides, biological controls, cultural practices. And then lastly, you end up with an AA that's intended to drive systemic change. So here, the alternatives we would consider, you know, are approaches that incorporate agroecology or regenerative ag systems. And we're trying to push the system in that direction. So, you know, we thought about this and which is the approach that we ought to use in uh, California. Uh, where we landed on this was we think that uh, we should think about AAs in the regulatory setting here in California is focused on this progressive approach. Um, why? Well, because the informative approach kind of runs into this problem of the inertia that faces any shift to a new technology. And we think it might be exacerbated in this case by the fact that so many pest control advisors are in one way or another linked to the manufacturers of, cons, um, of uh, conventional pesticides. Also the affirmative language of the California law 
uh, leads to the rejection of this because there's definitely a flavor in it that safer alternatives ought to supplant the use of, of um, uh, conventional, more toxic materials and that the regulator should be taking it into account in their decision making. We rejected the protective approach for much the same reason. It's too narrow and it doesn't reflect the proactive vision that the California Environmental Quality Act presents or that the pesticide statute presents. And it's also out of sync with a recognition generally, I would say uh, at Cal EPA and even in DPR, that sustainable agriculture is something that we ought to be driving forward. And we also turned our backs, I guess one could say reluctantly to the use of AA to drive transformative change, mainly because AA and the regulatory structure in which it would have to operate is constrained. I mean, decisions are made in short timeframes and are often series of individual decisions that don't allow for the type of engagement or vision or authority that one would really need to see systemic change of this sort. We think AA of a progressive sort can, uh, can uh, contribute to tr transformative change, but we don't think that it can drive it. Okay, so what do we do here? Um, do we have any uh, conclusions about what AA might look like in the, a in the pesticide area? Uh, I know I'm running out of time, so let me just kind of lay out for you kind of a, a gen very general framework approach that we're thinking about that came out of the workshop. So really it has three steps to it. Um, in the first step, uh, we think that California needs to develop an overall methods for AA, and that would be very inclusive, right? So that we have a broad stakeholder involvement to develop guidance for how AAs would be performed. Uh, something maybe like IC4 type guide, but specific to pesticides in California. Then we feel at, uh, for individual pesticides, um, suppose a new pesticide is being um, promoted or proposed for use or an existing pesticide is coming up for reevaluation. Uh, we thought that at the state level, OHIA and DPR could work together uh, with stakeholders to develop what we call a meta alternative assessment. So there's too much local information that is required to make specific judgments about which alternative might work in a particular region or even say at a particular farm. But we can make some general conclusions about the range of alternatives, the pros and cons of those alternatives and the general circumstances in which one might be preferred to another. And that could allow for the development of a set of default decision rules that could be used at the local level as part of restricted materials permitting. So the idea here would be given the limited capacity that CACs might have for technical evaluation of AAs, they could rely upon a state level meta alternatives assessment to make some judgments based on the default decision rules. And to the extent that there are individual local conditions that would drive perhaps decision-making to a different alternative, those would be focused on receive input from state and other uh, stakeholders and justifications, affirmative justifications for moving away from the default decision rules might be required. Okay, so that's it for me. I appreciate your uh, patience with me and the time. And I guess if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to take, on, uh, take them on. Thank you, Tim. Uh, as usual, you demonstrate your systems thinking expertise um, and it's fascinating. I, I, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I have a question. Um, you've laid out this sort of uh, kind of macro level look at the, the decision points and how this, how approaches might be move AA forward. I'm, I'm, I wonder if you could speak to what the drivers are for the next steps, given that it sounds like there are requirements that some form of AA be conducted. It's not clear to me by whom or how, but something needs to change. What, what's going to drive that? Well, I think you're seeing, you know, I'd say in the last 10 years, there was increasing uh, agitation for the kind of meaningful implementation of these alternatives requirements in the statute. Um, and it, I think a lot of it came to a crescendo with uh, when methyl iodide was proposed as an alternative for methyl bromide, and there were a series of lawsuits and some court case, uh, court tentative rulings came out of the court. Uh, in favor of the requirement for meaningful AA. Uh, 
the manufacturer of methyl iodide withdrew it from the market. So that kind of died down. But then there was a subsequent reevaluation of a chemical uh, in which the court kind of held uh, the agency's feet to the fire and said, look, you got to do a meaningful alternatives assessment here. And uh, DPR has taken steps uh, to do that. They did it specifically with chlorpyrifos, um, trying to, to uh, pull together a work group to look at alternatives and see what could be done. Um, but they haven't integrated it yet meaningfully into the registration process. I think it's going to happen mainly because of the, the uh, you know, the impetus driven by the court rulings and a very active advocacy community in California. The other way in which it might happen is that to the extent at the county level that pest control advisors continue not to do uh, explicit uh, alternatives assessment. By that, I mean uh, they're not providing copies of AA to the uh, CACs and they're not available to the public, which you know leaves some people to wonder whether they're being done at all. Uh, but to the extent that that continues to happen, I mean, there are provisions in California law that uh, provide for appeals of even these local permits and the failure to do an AA would be a, uh, you know, a fairly straightforward claim um, to, uh, to support. Right. So I think that the specter of legal enforcement, plus I think a growing acknowledgement of the importance of sustainable ag in California, both of those things are coming together that I think there's some momentum here to see this happen. And I should say DPR and the CACs, uh, we had representatives from those agencies in the work group, and they were, uh, I would say, sincerely interested in ways in which AA could be used to um, kind of build into the regulatory systems. Thanks, Tim. And, you know, being part of Cal EPA, it, it highlights the need for us to break down some of those silos between the different departments so that we can collaborate on the practice of AA and, and apply it in our work. Um, I see Stephanie has her hand up. Do you have a question? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for this inspiring uh, presentation. I really liked the shift. I think that we can see there from asking the question, are there alternatives to what would be the consequence of a non-authorization of a pesticide? Because at least for biocides, we often have, or not often, but sometimes have the problem that we, at least we think there would be no consequence if we would not authorize this use because it just doesn't make sense. For example, cutting knives that are equipped with um, antibacterial substances, for example, or something like this. And at the moment, there's no, possibility to regulate this and if we shift from other alternatives to what are the consequences of a non-authorization I think that this would be an interesting shift and um, I always envy a little bit um, FDA asking um, to show the use of disinfectants um, disinfecting soaps to prove that there's a benefit if those are authorized and I wanted to ask whether you are aware of other examples where this shift of perspective has taken place in regulation? Oh, um, well, that's a, that's a good question. You know, um, it's interesting as you were speaking, I was thinking about the fact that at least in principle, you see this shift in, um, um, in the EU with respect to, um, you know, comparative assessment of pesticides by member states, where there is a requirement uh, when approval is sought for the use of uh, pesticides that the agencies are to engage in a comparative assessment. Um, we're not done looking at that. It's hard to get a lot of information. We haven't been able to get a hold of what these comparative assessments look like, but by the looks of the guidances from each of the various member states and general guidances, there seems to be, I mean, I think the problem you run into is you'll get requirements to do alternatives assessments or comparative assessments or whatnot, but the devil's in the details. And, uh, you know, as best we can tell, doesn't look like there's been any comparative assessments done in the pesticide setting, or very few, where an alternative was identified or that they even got to the, uh, you know, assessment of the environmental or health effects of alternatives because the alternatives are knocked out on other grounds before you ever get that far. So I guess I would say, yes, I'm aware of other scenarios like this, but it's really hard to see ones where they're actually implemented in a way where we can track some effects of them. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the question, Stephanie. Um,
Yeah, I think this is a great um, look into a different approach or a different area where A can be used. Um, I see uh, Kevin Masterson has uh, a point here or a question. Um, has there been thought about how to build an in, it, iterative AA process to take into account changing data on pesticide impacts, especially as it relates to new revelations about chronic impacts? One example is that the EPA chronic invertebrate aquatic life benchmark for Imaldic, yeah, I can't pronounce it, dropped in orders of magnitude after new information came to light. Any thoughts on that, Tim? Yeah, so that's it. I mean, I think that's a terrific question. I mean, my initial reaction was, um, I wish we could get to a point where we could really turn and start answering those more kind of uh, implementation questions in the sense that, you know, just figuring out like the metrics to be used for some of the uh, impacts of pesticides. So let me give you an example of this. Like what, what Kevin's asking is a very good question. Like, what do you do when something changes? But I think we're still in a position where we're still trying to figure out, well, how do you measure in the first instance what the impacts are uh, in a way that people can, you know, build some consensus around your data sources and the metrics you develop. Here's an example of that. When we were doing this workshop, we really wanted to focus on soil health as a uh, attribute that you would measure. I mean, there's a petition, I don't know where it stands at this point before EPA right now, to include soil health measures as part of the assessments they do for registration generally. And I think that's kind of uh, a really important aspect, particularly if you want to take into, you really want to give credence to some of the non-chemical alternatives. So we're still at a stage, I think, where we're trying to figure out like what are the right metrics to use, let alone what happens when the data changes. I think probably what the most practical approach for changing data would be to have a reevaluation process because look, you know, data is going to change in both directions, right? Things that used to, we thought of as being harmful, maybe they're not so harmful. Things we think weren't harmful, it turns out, wow, it turns out they are. So we ought to be able to make these AAs living documents. We got to balance that against giving some level of certainty to the growers and other folks who have to make decisions about this. And I think regular reevaluation and finding, you know, providing resources to make those things meaningful is an important part of an AA process. Thank you, Tim. All right, well, thank you, Tim, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, we're gonna move on now. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Matt Wilk from ECA, who uh, is gonna give us uh, some perspective from across the pond, Matt. Hello. Uh, yes, thanks, Carl. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm just going to check if the controls are working on the slides, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, dynamic effects of substitution in reach authorization system. Um, one moment, I managed to switch myself off. Okay. Uh, right. So I, initially, I'll start off with some introduction and some background material. I'll then move on to the results of the analysis that we had on the uh, review report. I will uh, touch upon the reasons and behaviors of companies that are making these applications and more we have discovered uh, before moving on to the substitution by, by substance, um, followed by a more detailed uh, story about the companies that have submitted review report and for those that haven't and, and, and the reasons why before closing with a, a summary and a, and a conclusion. Okay, so this presentation focuses on the reasons for not submitting a review report and also alternatives and substitution of uh, harmful substances. So we'll, we'll discuss how companies handle uh, authorization process and how requirements affect their uh, behavior. To note, uh, this work is based on the analysis of the ECAS documentation for applications for authorizations or AFAS, as we would like to call them, where the time to send the review report expires uh, before the end of before the end of this year. Now, it's important point is that the application when the application is made, uh, it's a, it's a set date that the companies have uh, time up until. Um, and in order for them to continue using the substance, they have to submit a review report at least eighteen months before that date, so that they may be able to uh, continue using the substance. And that that point will become uh, more relevant later on. Um, just to point out as well, some cases are straightforward, uh, but others are a bit more complex and I'll follow that up uh, with uh, with some details uh, later on. Uh, 
So the background on the uh, authorization process. Uh, so this is requirement to uh, restrict substances of very high concern. So we're talking about a CMR, so carcinogenic, mutagenic, and toxic to reproduction substances, as well as uh, PBT, so persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic, as well as very persistent, very bioaccumulative, bioaccumulative um, substances. So it's, 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 a, it's a broad sort of uh, scope here. Um, and there are key elements of the application uh, for authorization. So there's a chemical safety report, which contains uh, more details on the substances um, and the compounds, uh, the company's operations, the, the usage. Um, and it's, it's a long and, and a quite detailed document. The, the second document is the analysis of alternatives. So if these are readily available, um, we see companies providing a wide array of, of steps they have taken to identify these alternatives and how they hoping to switch to these alternatives. If the, they haven't got them yet, they will perhaps provide some details on how they uh, aim to, to, to get to that point where they have some alternatives available. The third element then is the socioeconomic analysis, which is the key element here, because these are, again, substances of very high concern. So the only way that the companies can get uh, authorization to use these substances is to um, show to the Committee for the Socioeconomic Analysis here in ECA that the uh, continued use the, the, the benefit of continued use outweighs the, the, the impact or the, the harmful impact on, on human health uh, and the environment. And the final element that's often featured in the, these applications is a substitution plan. Now, this is a, a, a time-limited commitment from, from companies. It's a detailed plan, but it, it's, it's a commitment where they say they will uh, substitute to a known or again, maybe not yet more quite yet developed alternative in a, in a given time. Um, and perhaps important to bring again, the uh, important aims of the authorization process uh, as part of REACH. So this is, we're trying to ensure the good functioning of the internal market in the EU while assuring that the risk from the substances of, of very high concern are properly controlled and that, that the, these substances are, are removed or replaced by suitable alternatives where these are um, economically, economically viable. I will move on to the, the results of our analysis. So there we've had 18 applications that we looked at that were subject to this review and we had three possible outcomes. So the yellow bar is authorization holders could not find a substitute before a sunset date. So they submitted a review report to continue the use of the substance. The blue bar is authorization holders that seized uh, operations in the EU or exported uh, perhaps outside the EU or, or simply stopped using the substance altogether. And the final one is where they have, the green one is where they uh, substituted the use of the substance with identified alternative after, after some time uh, after the initial application. Um, this is uh, an interesting um, slide here where we talk a little bit about the, the reasons and behavioral aspects that we have noticed about companies. So even if there are planned substitutions, some applicants are still not uh, able to switch uh, during the review period. And this could be due to technological change, um, costs involved, and it links quite closely with the review report. So essentially the review report is almost like another uh, application for authorization. In most cases, it, it, most cases it simply means that there are potential alternatives, but they are perhaps not yet developed or not um, are not immediately available. This is due to technical or economic feasibility. Perhaps there is an investment that the companies have to make or make substantial changes to their operations, and they simply need more time uh, to substitute. However, we have noticed that most applicants who need to change the substance, they undertake a comprehensive literature review uh, and conduct serious alternative analysis in order to replace these substances and quite often they, they seek support from from academics and uh, consultants. So this is uh, the table uh, where we can see the companies, the substances that they're using and it's split in, in uh, two sections uh, where the yellow section is uh, focusing on the companies that have uh, provided review report and then reapplied or the green one is where they haven't uh, provided uh, the review report um, on the on the asterisks here. Uh, 
these are so-called unusual cases. So plastic planet, I will cover that immediately uh, in, the, in the next slide. But uh, on the RAG Actienges, um, they, were, they were using TCE. They applied for, uh, for four years um, application, but they couldn't find any alternatives for their use. So this is a coal mining uh, activity, but they didn't intend to use, uh, to use that substance beyond the four years because uh, they were anticipating that the operations at the coal mining facilities will, will cease and therefore this, uh, this use has been effectively discontinued. Um, DCL, DCL Corporation is uh, uh, lead chromate pigments that we use. Um, there was a, a court case and there was an appeal which led to the withdrawal of the AFA. And um, DCL Corporation decided to uh, stop supplying uh, the substance to the downstream users and effectively uh, later on switch to uh, other, other pigments. Um, Okay, so now onto the companies that, or applicants, I should say, that have submitted the review report. Um, they, they were not able to substitute substances of very high concern, and they provided that uh, review report. So the plastic planet, this is the example um, I, mentioned, I mentioned before. This is one application, but it actually had three companies. So the plastic planet, they have applied for recycled PVC, and um, the commission is quite likely to ask them for more information on this. I mean, the, the application they have applied for is to recycle PVC. So they, they cannot really substitute the substance. Um, so their so-called substitution plan is, is focusing on um, reducing the content of DEHP uh, in, the, in the sort of the recycling that they will receive in the future to 0.1%. Um, and that is why they uh, provided the uh, the review uh, review report. Whilst uh, the other companies that were with them, which is uh, Vinaloop, they have sent a letter to the commission and they have ceased the, oper the operations. And the third company was uh, was uh, Stena, and they have uh, well never actually used the substance. They've applied for authorization, but then they they ended up not using it, and that, that's why they haven't submitted a review report. Whilst Plastic Planet has. However, they are part of one application, so it makes it a little bit uh, difficult with these, with these statistics that I presented earlier. Um, I'll move on to the, the next, I guess, group of companies uh, here. So Lanxess, Urenco, and Grupo, uh, Cole, and, and Spolana, they, uh, they have many similarities in their applications in that they thought that they'll be able to, uh, to substitute. They, most of them had uh, a clear uh, alternative, but for one reason or another, they were not able to do it uh, in time, and therefore they submitted uh, the uh, the review report to to continue use of of the substance. Our blue cube is is a, a bit of a special case. This is uh, automotive uh, applications. Uh, the company is 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 producing Alcantara uh, sort of synthetic uh, leather. And they, where they were using TCE and they just decided that it's much easier for them to completely uh, move away from using TCE. So effectively they, they introduced a new technology that moves away from, from TCE altogether. The, the last two examples, Domo and Microporus, there are even more complex cases. So they, um, they do have potential alter alternatives, but there are, in case of Domo in particular, there are issues with the local government uh, permissions. Um, however, in general, the, their alternatives require a substantial investment, um, according to them, into their facilities uh, and also lots of changes. So again, they submitted review reports to gain perhaps a little bit more time in order to be able to bring their operations um, into in order to to, to switch the substance uh, switch the substances to available uh, alternatives. Now, uh, moving on to the uh, applications where there were no uh, review reports. So this is the situations where they were able to substitute, uh, and this is the majority of cases here. You can see that these companies, uh, Yara, Ineos, and others, they were able to substitute successfully. Um, some of them stopped probably for commercial reasons. Now, we can't confirm that uh, 100%, uh, but I did mention DCL. They, we know that they have uh, moved away from, from using the harmful substance. Um, 
And I did also cover the, the seized use, uh, the three examples at the bottom here I've covered uh, in, in a bit more detail on why they have stopped using the, the substances. Okay, so in summary, we were supposed to receive uh, review reports from 18 uh, authorization uh, holders by the end of this year. Uh, now, 56% of the total, they have not submitted review report by the deadline. And, and this is because them or their clients had started using uh, substitutes. And these are the all the substances that they have moved away from and into. And I will not read all of them out. I think the slides will be available um, after after the event, so it, you can you can have a look at them at, at your uh, at your leisure. Um, I think it's it's important to emphasize here at this stage that this is uh, just the current situation, and and this can change, and we are monitoring uh, of this as well. Um, and also, it's important to add that none of the review reports that I have covered here uh, have yet been agreed by the Commission. So, in other words. These are the tons that you have seen, the applications and review reports, but they are still uh, subject to subject to change. Um, going going back to the statistics here, so ten percent of them stopped the use for commercial reasons, and uh, forty four percent of the total uh, of them reapplied, so submitted a, a review report. As you can clearly see, the percentages don't add up because there was this overlap, as as I've mentioned before, where the number of applications don't always match the number of, of uh, companies. So there's there's a little bit of a mismatch on that, but we wanted we wanted to show uh, these additional regions where they stopped for um, commercial reasons. And final slide. Okay, so in most cases, AFA requirement leads to substitution away from substances of very high concern to an available alternative. As you can see in the graph to the right shows the original tonnage was about 42 uh, kilotons. And at the moment it's one kiloton. So it's like a 97% uh, reduction. Um, often the alternatives are known as companies disclose them in their application. And we have had this information. Uh, this is quite useful to us uh, and helps us with not only opinion making, but also when processing application and there is currently effort uh, made in house to organize such report repository for for future use um, however there are some substitutes that have unwanted properties but if they are not regulated companies can continue using them um, in other words a substitution a requirement away uh, from substances substances sorry uh, for very high concern does not dictate what companies will use as alternatives it's rather they are, I guess, at liberty to, to select what's the best alternative for them. And if then regulators consider that these are unwanted substitute, then they need to uh, regulate um, these substances. And partly for this reason, ECHA is uh, identifying today groups of substances that should be regulated uh, rather than regulating on a substance by, uh, by substance basis. And I think that's uh, that's everything uh, from me. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Fascinating. Um, looking into the chat, uh, Joel Tickner has a question. He says, Matt, it's clear the authorization process advances transition from substances of very high concern, but how is or can ECHA guide them towards better alternatives? Daniel's case shows this isn't the case. Um, do you want to comment yeah. on that? Um, uh, this is, yeah, no, this is a good example. I, I've seen Daniel's paper and it, it, it has obviously influenced in, in a way uh, my presentation here as well. I think uh, the, the issue you have mainly is with these complex cases um, because they're not, uh, they're often not uh, straightforward. And I think it's important to look at on, on, these, on these cases on the sort of pay case by case basis and what, what the company's circumstances are. Uh, at the time, but I, I take I take that point that it's yeah it, it could have been a bit more straightforward on occasion. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, one question I have is in, in and I'm not familiar with how this works, but um, it seems each company has their own specific use case. Um, to what extent have companies collaborated or shared information to look at uh, beefing up an AA to look at alternatives or to stimulate innovation? So they don't have to go to the review report, perhaps. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, no, this is this is a, a very good question. And sadly, it, it highlights a little bit the complexity of, of the process. So you can have a group of companies making one application. Within that application, it's, po it's possible to have different users and to make it a little bit more complicated still is some companies then they can just, I guess, go towards certain users, but not all of the users. Um, what that means is uh, if they, uh, but the point here is that they would have to do it pretty much themselves. So if they are perhaps mature enough to have, a, uh, you know, this we're talking about competitors here, okay? So if they can have a, a constructive conversation between themselves and say, look, um, we want to, you know, um, get this sorted. How about we get together and, and make some progress? That's possible. We have seen that, I think, with CTAC. Um, this was uh, a Chromium application. I understand that there are some legal and political challenges with that, but, but the point was still that uh, companies were somehow able to, to get together and start at least start a dialogue. And, and I think we, as, as we move perhaps towards this grouping, um, then companies will then have to be a bit more creative. Perhaps that will incentivize them even more to start looking into opportunities when they can work together and, and advance that. Because majority of cases, they really do want to engage. Once they find out that there is a requirement, they really have to move away. Then they sort of, almost like wake up and say, okay, right, what do we have to do? Yeah, a good point. Um, I don't see any other um, questions at this time um, in the chat, or let me see if any uh, one has their hand up. I don't see. Um, okay, well, thank you, Matt. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. If we have time, we can circle back at the end. Um, of course. Now, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Daniel Slungay. Uh, from University of Gothenburg. And uh, Daniel, we're gonna give you control of the screen. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I always um, feel a bit um, it's, it feels a bit special to talk about this topic. It's because I, I wrote my master thesis 25 years ago about the Swedish ban and the effects of that, the Swedish ban on trichloroethylene. Um, and when we started our uh, center uh, for future chemical risk assessment and management in 2016, I hadn't been working for, uh, with chemicals for 15 years. I realized that the, that the sunset date for trichloroethylene in, in Europe uh, was the same year. Uh, so we started to look at this again. And uh, uh, so, so it's, a, it's a bit special. And I think the, the, the kind of a title for this conference, Accelerating Safer Alternative Assessment and Alternatives is quite appropriate in, in that uh, perspective. So um, the paper uh, that I will present is joint work with uh, Professor Thomas Sterner at uh, our university and also Ida Andersson. And we have done part of this in, uh, in collaboration with um, ECA. Um, now let's see how I move for the next. I can't really see the, there, there you go. Okay, um, so um, this paper is uh, rather uh, straightforward. Um, so the purpose was to analyze the effect of reach authorization uh, requirements on the use of trichloroethylene in metal parts cleaning. There are many other uses as we heard in the last presentation, but we are focusing on metal parts cleaning. So we uh, ask what solvents and method have replaced uh, trichloroethylene. Uh, what has the cost of substitution been and what role has the reach authorization played? So this is kind of a nice follow-up of the last presentation, I think. And we also discuss lessons learned and, and uh, uh, for, for reach authorization and, and substitution of substances of concern. The method we use is, um, well, we have looked at the literature, including a detailed review on the applications for authorization. We have done interviews with the uh, key stakeholders and industry experts, and we have done an industry survey. 
and this was conducted in, uh, in collaboration with ECA. Um, but I should say also that this is uh, our analysis, so we are solely responsible for it. And I should also say that we are uh, about to submit this to a journal, but we have not done so yet. So I'm very much looking forward to comments and discussion. So a few slides on the background. Um, uh, this is hardly necessary. I could just um, say that, of course, uh, identifying and reducing the risk posed by substances of very high concern is very central to reach. But progress has been slower than envisioned by September 2019, I think, uh, 435 substances were on the candidate list and 120 substances on the authorization list. This was uh, far below the kind of 1500 substances on uh, that, that uh, were uh, envisioned to be uh, identified when REACH was launched in, in 2006. And there is also a risk of replacing substances of concerns uh, uh, with chemicals with, with similar uh, characteristics. And there are many examples of this, like a BPA, uh, bisphenol A with bisphenol S, for example. Um, so uh, trichloroethylene, uh, as many of you uh, may know, is a chlorinated solvent mainly used for degreasing in the metal industry and as an intermediate in chemical produ production. There are many other uh, uses, but the bulk of the use of trichloroethylene has really been in metal parts cleaning. And it is one of the kind of substances of concern that has been used in very high volumes in Europe until recently, I should say. Uh, and it has also been used by many small and medium scale enterprises uh, posing specific risk then to, to health uh, for workers. Uh, and it is also a substance I've learned uh, after talking to Joe Tickner and his group that it's still widely used in, in the US and that you are uh, planning uh, or actually reevaluating the risks uh, uh, with TCE. And the neurotoxic and carcinogenic effects are well documented. Um, before I uh, move into that, I should say that there are of course alternatives uh, uh, in terms of degreasing solvents and methods. There are chlorinated solvents uh, there are uh, other types of solvents like modified alcohols, uh, fluorinated solvents and uh, hydrocarbons. And there are also uh, other methods like aqueous cleaning. And in our paper, we go through this, but I will not stay long there now. Um, so within REACH, now you know all about this uh, after uh, the last presentation, but uh, TCE was included in 2010 in the candidate list. In 2013, it was included in Annex 14, which is the authorization list. And uh, following them, there were 21 applications for authorization, but only two for the use of TCE as a degreasing solvent in metal parts cleaning. But note that these authorizations it covered one covered 62 downstream users and another one covered more than 500 downstream users. Uh, and the sunset date was then uh, 2016. Uh, and beyond that, you could only use the substance with an authorization. And then 39 firms only notified ECA that they had made use of uh, these authorizations. So, there were many companies that substituted away from trichloroethylene between after they had submitted or were part of these authorization applications and the actual uh, and the sunset date. But then authorizations expired in 2019 and 20, and there were new kind of no uh, uh, application for continued use after that. So what happened was basically the question we, we asked. Um, and uh, so uh, I have three slides on the results. Uh, as I said, it's quite straightforward. Uh, so among the, the surveyed firms, the main substitutes is, is uh, perchloroethylene, uh, 
uh, some companies replaced the TCE with perchloroethylene in combination with other solvents like hydrocarbons, alcohols, aqueous cleaning. Uh, there is also methylene chloride, as you can see, uh, and so on. And uh, some companies uh, continue to use older types of machines in metal parts cleaning with perchloroethylene also. Actually, uh, a couple of the survey firms even use uh, or, or state that they use uh, machinery that is actually not allowed according to the authorizations. But in general, the machine part was a very old uh, also for um, moving after moving on to uh, using perchloroethylene. Um, and we find that the cost uh, of substituting TC with perchloroethylene is, is low. Uh, it's, uh, you basically only need to do minor equipment adjustment. Um, and um, so you can continue to use the same uh, machine as before. And, and, and also when it comes in the operating cost, there are no big differences, a little bit higher energy costs but yeah, no, no really big differences. But when you substitute TC with modified alcohols or aqueous cleaning systems, we find uh, indications of, of much higher cost if you invest in a new machinery, of course. But it also depends a lot on how many cleaning steps, et cetera, and the, and the nitty gritty on the cleaning quality, et cetera, that you need. Um, there's much more to say about this, of course, but let me uh, uh, continue on, on the third uh, result slide. So what factors did influence uh, TC substitution? Well, sector specific requirements, not least the aerospace uh, industry uh, had delayed substitution. Many of these kind of late substitutors that were included or responded to this survey uh, were operating at least partly in the aerospace uh, sector. Um, and the main reason stated by the companies that we interviewed was that uh, they, they substituted to avoid to renew the application for authorization, which is a time consuming and costly process. Uh, we asked them also if they would have uh, conducted a different uh, or taken a different decision if they had a longer uh, authorization period. So would they then have looked at other alternatives, etc. But um, that's what well, companies this, this uh, responded that they, they would have continued or, or switched to PERC uh, anyway or made the same decision. Uh, looking a bit more broadly on this, as I said before, there were many companies that substituted TCE after they were in, the substance was included on the candidate list and in the authorization list. So it's fair to say that uh, this does incentivize substitution. Before moving on, I should say that, uh, as you might have noted, uh, there were 39 companies that were uh, made use of the authorization, we sent our survey to them, as well as to uh, uh, metal industry uh, companies uh, in the UK, through uh, which we contacted through uh, suppliers of chlorinated solvents. So it's not a total uh, excellent sample, but we think in combination with the interviews with industry experts and so on that we have, a quite good representation and that this is more or less the picture for those five, 600 companies that uh, applied for TC authorization. Okay, uh, so conclusion and discussion. Um, well, switching from TCE to perchloroethylene is perhaps not a major achievement. Uh, trichloroethylene is classified as a carcinogenic 1B uh, in the EU, it may cause cancer, uh, while perchloroethylene is a carcin 2 substance in the EU suspected uh, carcinogenic. It was evaluated in 2013 and the evaluation uh, concluded there were no need for further risk management measures. But when we read now report from the US EPA, uh, we, we see that the opinions are, are quite different where uh, 
a, where the US EPA state that there are considerable risk both for the use of TCE and the PERC, even if you use uh, more elaborate and, and modern machineries. So the substances are quite similar. Um, and if you take also in, 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 if you take into account the considerable cost of uh, developing uh, this regulation and the aim of it and, and the effort put in, into this, you would really hope that the benefits were uh, bigger. I mean, there's some benefits, I suppose, in, in this substitution, but not major. Uh, and it's fair also to say this is a slow process. Uh, we wrote a paper based on my master thesis in 2001, where we compared the Swedish ban uh, from 1996 with the Norwegian tax on TCE and perchlorethylene implemented in year 2000 with the strict technology and emission standards implemented in the late 80s in Germany, which all led to, uh, this is a, a comparison of the rate of reduction, um, and this has all these policy instruments have led to uh, a, a, a substantial reduction, while in Europe now this does not concern the last years, but it shows that the policy with, with policy instrument, you can, if you want, re, uh, achieve a faster uh, reduction of a, a known substance of concern. So um, two uh, recommendations, uh, or at least potential approaches, uh, need for group-wise approaches. Uh, I was part of a Swedish public inquiry a couple of years ago. It's called a future chemical risk assessment and management, where we proposed, and this we see is also partly implemented, that you move into uh, away from single substance assessment to group wise assessment. We actually recommended that if you have a, 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 a substance that is chemically have the same chemical structure based on you find that based on read across or something. Uh, and you have the same similar uh, structure as, as a substance on the candidate list, then that should be uh, put on a specific list of uh, suspected SVHCs and flagged as a chemical of concern until companies come up with additional information removing it from that list. Uh, of course, the size of this group is, uh, is very important to discuss how wide should it be or should it be more or smaller. But in this case, at least I think TC, perchlorethylene and methylene chloride should have been a part. Uh, a second recommendation, uh, sorry about that, uh, is that we think that, oh, there you go. Uh, that fees on uh, substances are very high concern and their uh, cousins uh, could be an in important tool in this respect. Even a low fee could incentivize substitution among firms with low substitution cost. And this graph is very old. Uh, it's based on uh, my master's thesis, but this shows that companies display widely different substitution costs. And there are quite a lot of firms that have low substitution cost that would be incentivized to substitute away from a hazardous substance if they received some uh, incentive to do this. Today, it seems like putting a, a substance on the candidate list is not a, a sufficiently strong incentive for companies to, to shift away. And this is indicated by uh, also the interviews that we have done now where, where people or companies continue to use old machineries and so on. So we feel that the, the, the pressure has not been enough in that respect. So uh, with that, I will uh, open up for questions and I look forward to comments. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, fascinating. I, it, it makes me think of, you know, here we've been working with TC for many years back in pollution prevention, trying to encourage um, people to move to aqueous based cleaners and whatnot. Um, uh, and it sort of begs the question to me is that it seems like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is that the AA process is not the weak, weak link here. It's really that it's the, the framework isn't, there are not enough incentives to stimulate innovation and alternatives without some other drivers. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, when we did this study in Sweden, some of these alternatives were quite new and there was an uncertainty around them and so on. But now, 20 years after, I would say that in metal parts cleaning, the alternatives are quite well known and, and, and tried out. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that uh, what you point to the incentives to, to shift. I mean, these are very effective, uh, effective metal degreasers, no, no doubt about it. And uh, there's also, I think, uh, a, a big discussion if you should have a risk management approach and you have these modern uh, machineries where uh, emissions are so much lower than the old types of TCE machines. Uh, or if you should have uh, this hazard based where you move away from uh, substances of concern, it's not so much of just controlling the risks. Yeah, very good. Um, I'm looking, I don't see any hands or any questions in the chat right now. Um, if we have time, we can come back and talk to Daniel. But at this point, uh, I think we'll move on and shift over to Paul Ashford. Um, and Paul, I'm, we'll, I'm sure, pick up where he left off in the last session. Um, but Paul, welcome uh, and love to hear what you have to say. Thanks very much, Carl. And uh, again, appreciation to the uh, organizers for the opportunity to uh, bring something of an update on perhaps a wider discussion, which is going on in Europe at the moment um, around the chemical strategy for sustainability. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to try and um, indicate what's going on here and particularly looking at it from a chemical user's perspective, or as we call them here, downstream user perspective um, to provide that um, that sort of perspective. And I've just lost the arrows. They were there a moment ago. They've gone. So I'm not sure, Molly, if we've got them. There we go. Um, so just to um, introduce this, uh, this element. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in the previous session that the chemical strategy for sustainability has been introduced as part of the wider European Green Deal, and it is fundamentally um, linked with uh, a number of other measures, uh, including the Circular Economy Action Plan. So there's a quite a significant connection um, between chemical strategy and the um, promotion of a circular economy. I should mention that the, um, although the European Green Deal was launched in December 2019, um, the, uh, the launch of the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability was the 14th of October last year, 2020. Um, so we have, I'm not sure it's the right word, been celebrating its first birthday in recent weeks. Um, but as you will see from what I'm going to present, it's actually um, stimulated an awful lot of discussion about the future structure of chemical policy in Europe. And there's no question about it that it's the most significant piece of chemical policy uh, or proposed chemical policy since REACH. Um, you can see the key, key themes here. I've highlighted uh, or I've listed a number. The, the main focal point is a toxic free environment, obviously looking to ensure that hazardous substances are not getting into the environment. Simplest way to do that, of course, is to, um, is to avoid them being in in products in use in the first place. And so what we see is um, a move from risk-based to hazard-based um, approaches within, uh, encapsulated within the strategy. Um, we see some, um, some uh, consideration of avoiding non-essential use of hazardous chemicals. So in other words, once you've established a hazardous chemical within a supply chain, um, the the determination of whether it should be continued to be used is one of essentiality. And we'll come back to that in a few moments time to really try and unpack that a bit further. Um, we also heard, I think, in Dolores' presentation or her last slide earlier on in the earlier session, also some discussion about safe and sustainable by design. And even as late as yesterday, we were there was a CEFIC um, digital um, dialogue going on on the meaning of that term. And one of the key questions is, is safe separate from sustainable or is it part of sustainability? And also what ultimately do we mean by safe? Because um, I think in the US particularly, you've tended to use the word safer, 
Um, I suspect that's because the lawyers are floating around. Um, but it's a, a really quite difficult concept. And depending where you are and how you define safety, um, it, it, it's a key issue. And it's a, and a really important question for supply chains in general. So moving to the number of policies involved here, and this is uh, not my slide, this is the commission slide. It, you can see, or it might have been a Suffolk slide, in fact, it's a pretty in, um, uh, intensive set of policy measures. Um, I think the original count was about 50 something, and it's now moved up to um, around 85 or 90 that uh, are really encapsulated within it. So a lot of different agenda items, which I'm not going to go through, you'll be pleased to know at this time. Um, but a few things that come out of here is um, a reference to most harmful chemicals is a, is a focal point. And I think this is one of the issues that we still have to wrestle with a little bit, which is our language um, in, in much of this, because we talk about um, non-hazardous or hazardous um, without necessarily describing which hazards we're referring to. We have language of most harmful chemicals, and we'll come back to this a bit later in the next slide. Um, we're also talking about new hazard classes, particularly on endocrine disruptors. Um, most of you will know or may know that um, when REACH was brought into being, um, there was no legal definition of an endocrine disruptor that could be used to enforce things. Um, and so what happened was that they introduced a, a catch-all in Article 57F of REACH, which allowed substances of equivalent level of concern to be considered, which is inevitably one of the major debate points and where endocrine disruptors would fit in that. Um, and so this is an attempt to try and clarify that from a legal perspective. But also interesting things like persistent mobile and top uh, mobile, persistent and mobile substances. And there's quite a big move around the PFAS agenda, particularly to see persistence of itself being a, a hazard um, uh, or an, an, uh, a hazard criterion, um, even without the mobility and the toxic or the or the bioaccumulation and toxic uh, characteristics. Also efforts to address the chemical mixture issue, um, particularly by um, the introduction of a generic mixture assessment factor. In other words, an, exist, an additional safety factor that could have particular impacts on things like coatings and adhesives where you have mixtures moving along the supply chain to essentially the end user in uh, whether they're consumer or professional so that's uh, one that's being watched um, there's also um, the safe and sustainable by design uh, activity which I touched on in the previous slide um, and there's also um, a plan to globalize the approach in other words looking to uh, use the chemical strategy for sustainability as a a further lever to move standards globally um, upwards. Um, and this is indicated by the fact that the CLP, the Classification, Labeling and Packaging Regulation within the European Union will be updated. Um, and that will put it out of step with the global harmonized system for a period with the hope that the um, EU will then try and influence the GHS uh, and the OECD process um, sorry, the UN process to actually adopt a similar strategy to the one that's being adopted in the EU, which is arguably the wrong way around. And so we won't have a harmonized system if we ever did have one. Um, we won't have one for a while. But um, um, I think it's uh, uh, inevitably the way that it's going to have to go if the EU wants to pull it, push ahead with the chemical strategy in the way it's outlined it at this moment in time. So moving on to the comments I was having earlier, I think in the previous presentations, we've heard about quite a bit about reference to substances of very high concern, uh, which are basically those in Article 57 of REACH currently, whether it's um, uh, CMRs, uh, PBTs and VP, VBs, or chemicals of equivalent level of concern. And that shift in focus will be more towards safe and sustainable chemicals. Um, and so we'll start to speak more about substances of concern, which I think aligns a lot more with things like the California list of chemicals of concern. So it will be a longer list um, uh, of chemicals than previously and probably closer aligned to some of the state activities in North America. Um, and there will be a definition of essential uses emerging, which we'll come back to in a few minutes time. Um, but you can see in the, the in the graphic that I've just in, installed at the bottom here, you can see the move away from substances of very high concern 
into the uh, the general risk approach that we um, we heard about from uh, Dolores, and finally to the substances of concern list. And you can see the additional health and environmental hazards that those would take in. So back to the case we heard about just earlier on, um, uh, you know, the category two carcinogen then becomes part of the uh, part of the agenda, and arguably would be Perk would arguably be a regrettable substitution in that context. Um, but we still have to ask, well, if we're defining our substances in this way, where do the most harmful chemicals definition fit in? And I think those are still questions that need to be answered and are the focus of uh, additional discussion in, uh, in the period we're in at this point in time. And while we're looking at this, I wanted just to, as I wanted the focus of this um, presentation to really be the downstream user, rather than the chemical industry per se. I wanted just to put a slide in here about where the chemical users started from with the introduction of the CSS. And I think it's fair to say that um, if you take the response of the supply chain to reach, originally when that was introduced in 2006, um, the supply chains thought that the main burden fell on the chemical manufacturers and that their job would be to generate data and to uh, create the registration dossiers um, which would be necessary. So they didn't really see themselves heavily involved in that process. And to an extent that was true because the heavy lifting was done by the chemical industry in those early stages. But obviously reach the registration piece of reach is only the R, you've got the evaluation, authorization and restriction of chemicals. And it became increasingly obvious to the downstream user community that they were starting to get involved and uh, implicated in all of this because there was a need um, to generate exposure scenarios. So we had to start being um, uh, interested in what, where these chemicals were being used and generating the, the exposure scenarios which could effectively demonstrate that they were being used safely. So you had the determination of things like risk characterization ratios, which became very relevant for both human health and environmental um, uh, controls and assessments. Um, and obviously the downstream users were increasingly involved in that to a point where if they wanted to keep their downstream use confidential, they themselves had to do their own chemical, um, chemical safety report to, re to respond to that. We then have moved into substance evaluation processes and risk management option analyses, which are essentially being the um, triggered by the chemical substances of very high concern and what the next regulatory action might be, um, which would come either to a, a, a phase out process with an authorization uh, with a sunset date, but an authorization option or a restriction uh, in various uses. Um, so again, this was beginning to affect the users much more because in the end, it's the users who have to look for alternatives. Um, the chemical industry might help, but if it's not in their supply chain or if the alternative is not in their remit, then they're less likely to be engaged in that. So this became much more involvement to the downstream users. And then we have um, a key point was that the, these decisions were being made at the use level, as I've just explained. So when the CSS was launched, we saw as consultants in the field, we saw huge amount more interest in from downstream users than we'd ever seen at the introduction of REACH because people um, or the supply chains were already sensitized to the fact that decisions like um, chemical, uh, chemical policy decisions were directly going to affect them. So we've had far more direct involvement with that process since that point. And there was, um, <clears throat> A concern, I think, and still remains that a lot of the terms that are being used in the language of the chemical strategy need further definition. And people are struggling, they're asking the likes of us and, and others, you know, what do these terms mean? And of course, at this stage, we are still actually exploring exactly what those, those things mean. And particularly things like essential use. Do they have to defend their use in societal terms or are we talking about an essential use of a chemical in a particular application and i'll come back to that in a moment but we're also seeing a complete revisiting of the role of alternative assessment which is why this presentation probably has particular relevance to to this uh, particular event um, because i think the thinking around alternative assessment is changing quite significantly and to my mind for the better in the context of, of, of this uh, agenda. So you've probably seen this graphic before. Again, it's a, a commission uh, graphic 
but it really shows the intensity of the decision-making processes and the policy development processes that are ongoing at the moment. Um, I've been involved in particularly the registration of a subset of polymers, which has been a discussion which has been going on for nearly 10 years. Um, but that's all mapped into a, one of those very small bullets that you can hardly read um, in, in there. So there's a lot of big agenda items which are tied up in this particular um, action plan. Um, most notably, the plan is to re open, reopen REACH uh, around the middle of 2023 um, and to have it essentially in place uh, and broadly being implemented by the end of this commission cycle, which is due at the end of 2024. So that's why there, there's a major time pressure on this. And uh, anybody who's been involved in policy development in Europe will know that if you really want to have any influence on the way these things are finalized, then you need to be involved now. And you can see quite a lot of discussions are going on in 2021 because broadly the text or the at least the concepts behind the text will be established certainly by the end of 2022 if these um, target dates are going to be met. And um, uh, you can see that in amongst the ones I'm highlighting, one of the things that's going on between uh, in 2021-2022 is the setting of essential use criteria. Um, and that will ultimately lead into probably what's going to be the poster child of this whole chemical strategy, um, which will be the um, phase out of not all non-essential uses of PFAS in the EU. Although it should be said that that is being enacted under a restriction, which will actually be structured under the old REACH process. But once you start introducing essential use language, you then have to uh, think that through a bit further. So what do we mean by an essential use? Well, um, there are different views. Um, the NGO community um, has taken essentiality to mean critical to the functioning of society. Um, this is sort of building on the Montreal Protocol agenda and, and use of essential use, but it should be borne in mind that the Montreal Protocol itself was actually structured, it had a very limited number of substances it was dealing with, and it had a very defined use set pattern that it understood. And in fact, the, the parties were the ones who were making the application for essential use. In other words, the governments as, in, as countries, not the uh, particular users. So there had to be a process going through. So it's a very different process than the one that I think is now envisaged under the chemical strategy. But we've seen um, documents coming through. This is one from ChemSec, um, where, where they are absolutely clear that we need to be um, focusing our attention of essential use on the application itself. And so they set out, and I know this will be impossible to read in any meaningful way, but the, well, the slides will be out afterwards and you can get the document off the web easily enough. Um, but they've set out a set of questions that you have to go through um, to actually decide whether you have a uh, essential use or not. And these are all about um, uses. So things, if you have a hazardous substance in a leisure product for leisure or play and toys or cosmetics or home gardening, you do not use, it's non-essential. So it just gets taken out. And even to the point where even what we might describe as essential or, or, or mainstream um, life, um, things that are part of our life's uh, normal li uh, daily life um, are also identified as non-essential for the simple reason that the logic is that you shouldn't have hazardous substance in any of those products at all. So if they're there, they should just go. And there is a logic to that, and you can see where it's coming from. Um, but it obviously is quite difficult to make those calls. And um, those that are promoting this approach to essential use as a shortcut, I think will probably run into some difficulty when we start trying to set criteria for this, because I think the member states will be very much more reluctant to have uh, the... Um, the values of their society being challenged through a chemical policy, but we'll see how that um, how that emerges. So the there is a, several questions to be asked here, and one of them is where should the definition or the question of essential use be addressed? And the um, at this point in time, we know that the NGOs want that at um, uh, at the um, application level. And they also want it almost immediately that the determination of a hazardous substance has been confirmed. So in other words, it's right at the front end of the decision making process. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, the 
the counter of that is the Cephic position, um, which is the chemical industry position, um, uh, the mainstream chemical manufacturers who see essential use positioned completely differently, actually as part of the authorization process. So in other words, they've gone through the whole risk risk agenda and the adequate control or non adequate control and added it in to a determinant for an authorization, which is obviously least impact and probably um, too extreme on the other end of, of that. So you can see the polarization in the discussion, and I think that's going to be taking some time to um, to be resolved. Um, interestingly, although it's not they've got no formal position on this that we've sort of been talking internally sort of um, informally with with some members of the Commission who see essentiality in the first instance being determined at the chemical level. In other words, the question, let's say if I take a, a resin which is used in a brake pad, um, the question of whether the chemical, um, uh, the, the, the resin, uh, if it is hazardous, uh, is needed, is essential to the manufacture of a brake pad to stop your car is the first question. So are there alternatives or alternative ways of stopping your car which can be introduced? Um, the question is not whether the car is essential, whereas in other, um, in other in, uh, in, uh, potential sort of uh, uh, interpretations, you could take it as the question is more about the car than the chemical. So these are the types of uh, uh, discussions that are ongoing. Um, and that, well, yeah. I just want to give you a, a, a one minute warning. We're running a little bit over and I want to give people time to ask your questions. So just sure. I'll, I'll finish off as soon as I can. I know we were squeezed for time when I came in. So fine. I'll try and get there. Um, so we have a, um, uh, a question about where is essentiality should be determined. But if you determine it at the chemical level, then immediately you're into um, an, uh, an alternative assessment, because that's exactly what an alternative ass assessment is doing, is saying, is there a way of doing something without using this chemical? And so where we're ending up is to see that essential use, uh, sorry, alternative assessment may come very much earlier in the process at the point of hazard determination, rather than at the point of um, uh, risk determination at a later point. So you'd only move to a safe use discussion if you had no alternative available to you. So it's a complete shift in the essential in the alternative assessment positioning. That will mean that more, more alternative assessments will be done, but they would be done earlier and probably be done in a more holistic manner, coming back to comments made previously. So I'm just going to my final slide, which is essentially one which essentially which summarizes really the current state of the discussions. Um, and it's fair to say that everyone in the European Union at the moment, regulators, industry, um, downstream users, even consumers are sort of almost being bombarded by what is a, an extremely ambitious strategy. Um, and the next steps I think for this will be um, tracking the discussions on all the issues where definitions and concepts are still under discussion. Um, piece together the interplay between them, because I've obviously just in this presentation talked about the interplay between essential use and alternative assessment. And, um, uh, and the key point here from this group's point of view is to ensure that there is an adequate alternative assessment mechanism in place to avoid the trap of regrettable substitutions. And that's typically based on either incomplete or uninformed or hurried decision making. So with that, I'm gonna close uh, and uh, try and bring back some time for us. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think you've sort of thrown down the gauntlet of the challenge here um, uh, in terms of where we go with AA. Um, I just wonder it, 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 if you were to say, you know, there, there's just a lot here if, it, and to keep track of, uh, what do you think the, the strategies for all of us should be first and foremost in terms of monitoring how the CSS is gonna be implemented and, and where we can be most impactful? So I think um, I think the key is that there needs to be confidence that an alternative assessment methodology is appropriate um, and is necessary in this decision making process. That that is the key, I think, because to be honest, I think it's also in, in its in its current position in reach is almost a, an, an also ran. Um, we, we, we only get there at the end and then we have the wrong people doing it, essentially. I think it needs to be a more holistic approach. So I think the key point here is to be um, 
giving assurance as a, a uh, as um, a four at least that there are reliable and robust methods for alternative assessment and that ultimately to be most successful they need to be multi-stakeholder you need to get more people involved earlier in that process and that i think is exactly the the point that's one of my real interests in the work of a4 and where it can uh, it can add value great that's a great way to uh in the session paul um Thank you. Um, I don't see any specific questions. We're, let me just move on uh, and uh, thank our speakers. Uh, we heard that really from the agricultural fields of California to the um, implementing big policies in the EU, AA is, is an important uh, factor. And this, this session was lessons learned. We've learned a lot of lessons, but there's certainly lessons to be learned. So I wanna just highlight to stick around tomorrow to the next sessions because we've teed up this, the importance of looking at tools and strategies used by the business community, which is the first session tomorrow. And that will be followed uh, by a session on looking at the future needs of AA and the role of A4, which I think has uh, been highlighted today, the importance of us continuing this discussion and continuing to work together. So, uh, and I also would like to thank all of our sponsors again, who made this possible. Uh, again, our speakers and for everyone's participation, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So thank you all for joining.